Hello again, Busy Bookworms. I am back with chapter 33 of Redeeming Love. Two more chapters. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. 1 Corinthians thirteen eleven. Paul headed for Sacramento to look for Angel. If he was going to save his marriage, he had to find the witch and bring her back. Michael clearly wasn't going to go look for her, and Miriam wouldn't rest until she was home. Paul couldn't stand seeing Miriam grieving over Angel any longer. How could she, how she could still see good in Angel after all this time? He couldn't even imagine, but Miriam did. Maybe that's why he loved her so much. Hadn't she seen good in him? Right now, he would do anything for her, even leave their home and look for Angel, if it would make her relax and take care of her health. He figured Angel would be playing her trade, plying her trade in the nearest thriving community. He sought out the Bravos first, thinking with her rare beauty, she'd be easily tracked down. However, Angel turned out to be a common name among prostitutes. He found many, but not her. After a week, Paul left Sacramento and headed west for San Francisco. Maybe Sacramento had not been big enough for Angel. Just in case, he was wrong about that. He stopped in every town along the way and asked after her. No trace. By the time Paul had reached San Francisco, he was convinced the search was fruitless. Too much time had passed since Angel left the valley. It had been almost three years. She had probably boarded a boat to New York or China by now. He didn't know whether to feel thankful for his failure or keep on searching until he found some information. Miriam had been so sure, so adamant. She's still in California. I know it. Someone must have heard of her. How could a girl like Angel just disappear? The whole situation bothered him greatly. What if he did find her? What was he going to say? We want you to come back to the valley? She'd know he was lying. He didn't want her to come back. He never wanted to lay eyes on her again. He couldn't imagine Michael's wanting her back either after all this time. Three years. God knew what she'd been doing all that time and with whom. But... Michael did want her to come back. That was the problem. Michael still loved Angel. He would always love her. It wasn't stubbornness or pride that had kept him from going after her this time. He said she had to decide. She had to come back on her own. Well, she wouldn't. A year should have told Michael that much. Surely two would have done the trick. When another year passed, even Miriam had given up hope that Angel would come back on her own. She said someone would have to find her. I want you to go, Paul, Miriam had said. It has to be you. Listening, he hated Angel more than ever. At last, he reached San Francisco. Fog covered the city, and Paul searched half-heartedly. Finding Angel would create more problems than not finding her. Was he supposed to drag her back to the valley the way Michael had the first time she left? What was the use? She would only leave again. And again, and again, couldn't Miriam understand? Once a prostitute, always a prostitute. Ugh. Apparently, some truths came too hard for a girl as sweet and naive as his wife. Or for a man as pure as Michael. Paul loved them both so much, and he couldn't see how finding Angel would help either of them. Why had Miriam been so insistent that he be the one to find her and bring her back? She wouldn't explain. She said he would find out for himself. At first, he'd refused, and she'd raged at him. He was stunned that this usually reasonable wife could be so fierce. Her words had been like a sword slashing him. Then she wept and said she couldn't go on this way. When she begged him to go find Angel, he couldn't bear it and gave in. Now here he was, a hundred miles from home, and missing Miriam so much it was a physical pain. He wondered why in the name of heaven he had ever relented. Angel was better lost than found. 
Distracted by his own grim resentment, he wandered aimlessly, looking around without really paying attention to what he was seeing. A young woman in gray caught his eye. She was across the street looking in the window and reminded him of Tessie. He hadn't thought about her in months, and the old sadness came up again, flooding him with pain. The girl leaned forward, and the back hem of her skirt raised just enough to show worn, black, high-button shoes just like Tess had worn. Miriam, what am I doing here? I want to be home with you. I need you. Why did you ever send me on this mad quest? The girl straightened and retied her short cap. She turned and waited for a wagon to pass before she crossed the street. Paul caught a brief glimpse of her face and his heart stopped. Angel. At first, he couldn't believe it was really her. It had to be his imagination putting her face over another after all these weeks of looking. She hurried across the street and walked quickly away from him. Pushing his hat up, he stared after her, wondering if he had seen right. He must have made a mistake. It couldn't be her, not just like that. But he followed anyway, just to get another look. The young woman walked briskly, her head up. Men noticed her all along the way. Some tipped their hats as she passed by. Others whistled and made bold propositions. She didn't pause or speak to anyone. She clearly had a destination. When she reached the heart of the city, she entered a grand bank on a main corner. Paul waited outside in the cold mist for half an hour before she came out again. It was Angel. He was sure of it. She was with a well-dressed gentleman, a man considerably older and more prosperous than Michael. Paul's teeth clenched. He watched as the two spoke together for several minutes, and then the man kissed her cheek. Ugh, high-class clientele, Paul thought cynically. And for all her prim and proper clothing, Angel was as brazen as ever. No decent woman would let a man kiss her on a public street, not even on the cheek. Miriam's words haunted him. You've always judged her, and so wrongly. Paul's mouth pressed tight. Miriam wasn't here to witness this scene. She didn't know anything about a woman like Angel. He had never been able to convince her. She had never quite believed in the existence of a girl called Angel and what she'd done in a brothel in paradise. You're not even talking about the same person, she said. But he knew what Angel was, even if Miriam and Michael never faced up to it. What on God's green earth? Had they ever seen in that worthless woman to love her with such solid, unchanging devotion? He would never understand it. He followed Angel to a simple two-story clapboard building not far from Portsmouth Square. There was a sign on the front door. He had to cross the street to read it. House of Magdalena. <sighs> there it was. Printed for any man to see. He had known all along. Now, what on earth was he going to do? Even if he told Miriam, she would never believe it. And convincing her would only hurt her more. Dejected and angry, Paul walked for a long time. It was Angel's fault he was in this situation. She had been a destroyer since ever first since he first laid eyes on her. First, she'd come between him and his money. He had thrown away gold once in a vain attempt to spend half an hour with her at the palace. Then she came between him and Michael. Now she was coming between him and his wife. He spent the night in a cheap hotel. He ordered supper in the dining room and then couldn't eat it. When he went to bed, he couldn't sleep. He kept imagining Miriam's tear-streaked face. You never even tried to understand her, Paul. And you don't understand now. Sometimes I wonder if you ever will. I understand, all right. And I want that witch out of my life forever. I wish she was dead, buried and forgotten. Paul slept fitfully and awakened long before dawn with the decision firm in his mind to go back to the valley. He would lie to Miriam. There was no other way to spare her. He would tell her that he had looked everywhere and couldn't find Angel, or he could tell her that he found out Angel had died, a fever, the pox, no, uh, not the pox, diphtheria, uh, pneumonia, anything but the pox. Or he could say she left for the East Coast and the ship went down going around the horn. 
That would be believable. But he could never tell her. He had seen her go into a brothel a few blocks up from the docks. Sickened at having to lie at all, he packed his things. All the weeks he had gone without his wife's sweet company because of Angel made him seethe. He would think of some way to convince Miriam it was a lost cause before he got home. He had to. On his way to the ferry that would take him across the bay, he began to have doubts. Miriam would want to know the name of the ship. Hmm. She would want to know the people to whom he'd spoken. Ugh. She would want to know a hundred details he'd have to make up. One big lie he could manage, but not a tapestry of smaller ones. Standing in the heavy fog, a chill started from within Paul. It wouldn't work. No matter what story he conjured up, Miriam would know. She always knew. Just as Michael had known what had happened between Paul and Angel on the road, without a word of it ever being spoken aloud. <sighs> Furious, he went back to the Clapper building. Seeing no reason to knock, he walked right in. Before him was a small foyer sparsely furnished with two benches and a hat rack. There were no hats on it. In fact, there was no one to ask him what he wanted, let alone whom. He heard women talking. Removing his hat, he entered a large sitting room and froze. It was filled with women, mostly young, and all staring right at him. Heat filled his face. Several things came to him at once. The girls were all sitting in straight-backed wooden chairs. There were no men in the room other than himself, and the place looked more like a classroom than a brothel parlor. They were all wearing the same somber gray dresses that Angel had been wearing yesterday. Angel wasn't among them. A tall woman standing before the others smiled at him. Her brown eyes were alight with amusement. Are you lost, sir? Have you come to mend your ways? The younger women laughed. I, I beg your pardon, ma'am, he stammered, confused and embarrassed. What was this place? <laughs> he thinks this is a hotel, one of the girls said, looking at the pack slung on his back. The others laughed. Oh, I bet he thinks this is something else altogether, don't you, honey? Another said, looking him up and down. Someone laughed. He's blushing. I haven't seen a man blush since 49. Ladies, please, the tall woman said, quieting them. She put down the piece of chalk. She brushed the white dust from her slender fingers and walked toward him. I'm Susanna. She held out her hand and he took it without thinking. Her fingers were cool, her grip firm. How may I help you? Um, looking for someone? Angel. Her name's Angel. At least, she used to go by that name. I, I thought I saw her come in here yesterday afternoon. Paul? He turned sharply and saw her, standing in the doorway. She looked surprised and dismayed. Come with me, please, she said. He followed her down a hall and into a small office. She took a seat behind a big oak desk. Papers were strewn over it, as were several books. On one corner was a plain brown hat box with a slot in it. Please, sit down, she said. He sat and looked around at the simple, pristine setting. He couldn't make any sense of it. Why would a madam have an office more suited to a nun? What sort of classes were being conducted in the other room? Arithmetic problems had been written on the board, but now that he faced Angel again, he didn't think to ask. The old animosity was back in full force. If it weren't for her, he would be home with Miriam. Angel was looking at him with her same directness, but she was different somehow. He looked back at her coldly, trying to figure out what it was. She was still beautiful, so incredibly beautiful, but she had always been that beautiful, cold, and hard as stone. He frowned. That was it. The hardness. It was gone. Now there was a softness about her. It was in her blue eyes, her faint smile, her quiet manner. She's serene. The thought stunned him, and he shook it away. No, not serene. She just doesn't feel anything at all. She never did. He remembered the day on the road. He couldn't exercise it. 
He wanted to say something and couldn't think of a word. He was angry, resentful, depressed, but he kept reminding himself he wasn't here for himself. He was here for Miriam. The sooner he got things said, the sooner Angel could refuse to return and he could leave in good conscience. Angel spoke first. You're looking well, Paul. He had the oddest feeling she was trying to put him at ease. Why would she want to do that? Yes, so are you, he said, sounding stiffly polite. It was true. Even in gray, she looked good, better than ever. She was one of those women who would still be beautiful even in her sixties, a devil in disguise. It was a shock seeing you, she said. Yeah, I'm sure it was. Her eyes searched his face. What brings you to the house of Magdalena? Let her sweat. Whose house is this? Mine. She didn't elaborate. She waited for him to say something. I saw you on the street yesterday and followed you here. Why didn't you come in? I didn't want to interrupt anything, he said. Do you still go by Angel? He couldn't get the edge out of his voice and he couldn't understand the look in her eyes as though every word he said grieved her deeply. Why should it? Nothing had ever grieved her before. It was another act. I still go by Angel, she said. It seemed appropriate. Again, that directness, straightforward to the point, yet gentler in some way that he couldn't ever remember her being. You look different, he said and glanced around. I expected you to be living in higher style than this. Lower, he mean. She looked amused, not defensive. He let a sneer show on his face. Nothing changes, does it? Angel studied him. He was right in one sense, at least where his hatred of her was concerned. Not that he didn't have enough reason, still, it hurt. No, I guess not, she said quietly. It's understandable. She had so much to answer for. She looked away. She couldn't stop thinking about Michael. She was afraid to ask about him, especially from this man who loved him so much and hated her with equal intensity. What was he doing here? Paul didn't know what to say. He sensed he had hurt her. She sighed and looked at him again, and he wondered if she was as calm as she seemed, if, if anything really touched her. It was one of the things he had despised about her. No arrow he shot had ever drawn blood. Do you ever go back to the valley? She asked. The question caught him off guard. I'll live there. Oh, she said, surprised. I never left. She didn't rise at the accusatory tone. Miriam told me you were planning to go back to the gold fields and try your luck again. Out of desperation, he said. Miriam talked me out of it. Angel's face softened. Yes, I suppose she would. Miriam was always saving a soul. How is she? She's going to have a baby this summer. He watched the color ebb from Angel's face and then come back slowly. Thank God. Thank God? She smiled, but it was sad and wistful. He had never seen her smile like that before. He wished he knew what she was thinking. That's wonderful news, Paul. Michael must be very happy. Michael? He gave a soft laugh, confused. Well, I suppose he is. He felt driven to say, He's been doing real well for himself the last few years. He bought some more land and a small herd of cattle last spring. He put up a bigger barn this fall. She didn't have to know she had taken half his heart with her when she left. Michael still had faith in God, and God would find him a good wife. He didn't expect Angel to smile at his news, but she did. She didn't look the least bit surprised. She looked relieved and happy. Michael will always do well. The heartless witch? Was that all she could say? Didn't she know how much Michael loved her and how much it had ripped him up when she left? And you, Paul? Have you worked things out with him again? 
He hated her for the reminder of what had happened. He hated her so much, he had the taste of steel in his mouth. As soon as you left, things went back to the way they were, he said, knowing it was a lie. Michael had never held a grudge. He was the one who couldn't let it go. Nothing was the same. She was still a wall between them. I'm glad, she said, and looked it. He's always loved you, you know. He never stopped. She saw his expression and changed the subject. You can help him build an addition on the cabin. He'll need one now. An addition? What for? With the baby coming, she said, he and Miriam will eventually need more room, and there will be more children in time. Michael always told me he wanted lots of children. Now he can have them. Paul couldn't breathe. He felt cold and sick. Angel frowned. What's wrong? He saw the truth, and the feeling in the pit of his stomach was nothing to the lump of pain in his chest. Oh, God. Oh, God. Is that why she left him? He could feel Miriam's presence and hear her words. You never understood her, Paul. You never even tried. Miriam with tear-filled eyes. Maybe if you had tried just once, things might have been different. Amanda would never let me inside, not completely. I don't think she ever let anyone know how much pain she felt. Not even Michael. Maybe you could have tried to help her. Miriam standing firm before his scorn. I never knew Angel. I only knew Amanda. And if it weren't for her, I never would have had the courage to come to you. Miriam, on the day she had come to his cabin. I have to do what is best for you. Angel was searching his face. What's the matter, Paul? What is it? There's nothing wrong with Miriam, is there? Miriam is my wife, not Michael's. She drew back, stunned. Yours? Yes, mine. I, I don't understand, she said shakily. How could she be your wife? He couldn't answer. He knew what she meant. How many times had he thought he was not good enough for her? She was just right for Michael. He had kept thinking that. All the while, he had fallen in love with her himself. He had been convinced right up to the day she had come to him in his cabin. Angel, <laughs> Michael's still waiting for you to come home. Her face went deathly white. It's been over three years. He can't still be waiting. He is. Paul's words struck her squarely in the chest. Oh, God. She shut her eyes for a moment. She stood and turned away. She pushed the lace curtain back to stare out the window. It was raining. She couldn't breathe past the pain in her chest. Her eyes were on fire. Paul saw the way her hand clutched the curtain until her knuckles were white. I think I understand, he said bleakly. Huh. You figured if you went away, he'd turn to Miriam. Eventually, he'd fall in love with her and forget about you. Isn't that it? Ugh. Hadn't he expected that to happen as well? Hadn't the possibility torn at his guts? He would have. She didn't even have to say it if you hadn't interfered. Once, Paul had said to Miriam that he didn't think Angel had the capacity for pain or love. Those words came back to taunt him now. How could he have been so wrong about her? When she turned to look at him, he was ashamed. Miriam is perfect for him, Angel said. She's the sort of wife he needs. She's pure and intelligent and tender. She has a tremendous capacity for love. He heard so much more than words this time. That's all very true, but Michael loves you. He wants children. And Miriam could have given them to him. And they understand each other. Because they're friends. Her eyes flashed. They could have been more. Maybe, he conceded. <laughs> Facing his own selfishness, 
If I'd had the courage you did, and if I'd left, but I didn't. I couldn't. Until this moment, he'd thought it was because he loved Miriam too much, but he saw clearly now that he had loved himself more. Angel had understood a higher quality of love. Sacrifice. Leaning forward, he put his head in his hands. Now he knew why Miriam had been so insistent that he be the one to find her. I was so wrong, he groaned. I was wrong about you the whole time. His vision blurred. He looked up again. I've hated you. Hated you so much, I... He broke off, unable to say any more. Angel sat down behind the desk again, saddened. You were right about me in a lot of ways. Her words only confirmed what he knew now. He gave a bleak laugh. I never even came close. And I know why. That day on the road, I knew you were right. You were right. I betrayed him. Her eyes filled. I could have said no. Did you know that then? She didn't speak for a moment. Some part of me must have known. Maybe I just didn't want to. Maybe it was my way to draw your blood. I don't know anymore. It was so long ago. I never wanted to think about it again. And then every time I saw you, there it was. I couldn't get away from it. She remembered the darkness in which she had lived. She remembered all those months that Paul had stayed away and how his absence had hurt Michael. She could imagine Paul's pain at the separation as well and his shame and the horrible guilt of it all. Hadn't she kept hum company with her own? It was on her head. She had allowed it to happen. For whatever reason, what did it matter now? She couldn't cast blame on anyone other than herself. The choice had been hers. She had never even thought of consequences. The repercussions had been like a stone flung into smooth water. The splash, then the widening circles. It was a long time before the water was smooth again, and the stone was always there, lying cold and hard in the silent pool. Michael, Paul, herself ruptured souls desperate to be put together again. The torment and rift between Paul and Michael had grown wider, not because Michael couldn't forgive, but because Paul couldn't forgive himself. Wasn't that just what she had felt most of her life? That everything that had ever happened to her had somehow been her fault. That she was guilty even of being born. She had learned in the last few years that she wasn't alone in those feelings. She heard them every day from other women who had experienced the same abuse as she had. Forgiving others for what they had done to her had come far easier than forgiving herself. There were still moments of struggle. Her mouth trembled. Paul, I'm so sorry for the pain I've caused you. Truly, I am. He sat for a long time unable to speak, thinking of all the time and all the persecution she had endured from him. And now she was apologizing. He had plotted her destruction and destroyed himself in the process. From that time, he had been consumed by hatred, blinded by it. I have been insufferable and self-righteous and cruel. The revelation was bitter and painful, but a relief too. There was an odd sort of freedom in standing before a mirror and seeing himself clearly for the first time in his life. If it hadn't been for Miriam, what would he have become? Loving her had softened him. She had seen something in him he'd never imagined anyone but Tess could see. And she'd seen something an angel he couldn't. He had wondered at it, but had stubbornly held to his own convictions. Michael's wife had been angel to him, the high-priced soiled dove from paradise, 
and he had always treated her accordingly. Now that he thought back, he couldn't remember one time when she had defended herself. Why hadn't she? He knew the answer to that as well. She had just given it to him when she said he was right about her. It hadn't been disdain or arrogance that had kept her silence. It had been shame. She believed everything he said about her. She believed she was soiled and unworthy, fit only to be used. And I helped convince her. I filled the role Michael refused to play. Remorse overwhelmed him. It hurt to look at her. It hurt even more to see the truth that he was greatly to blame for Michael's pain as well. If he had reached out just once, as Miriam had said, maybe things would have been different, but he had been too proud, too sure he was right. I'm sorry, he said. So very sorry. Can you forgive me? She wondered if he knew tears were pouring down his face, and she felt a sudden, inexplicable warmth toward this man. Michael's brother, her brother. I forgave you a long time ago, Paul. I left the valley and Michael of my own free will. Don't lay blame on that. Don't lay blame for that on yourself. She leaned forward, her hands clasped tightly on the desk blotter. Let's leave all that behind us, please. Tell me everything that's happened since I left. She smiled slightly, teasing him gently especially how a man like you ever managed to win a girl like Miriam. He laughed for the first time in months. God only knows, he said, shaking his head. He sighed heavily and relaxed. She loves me. She told me she knew the first time she met me she was going to marry me. Talking about Miriam made the warmth come flowing back. I'd watch her and want her so much and find every kind of reason why I wasn't good enough to kiss the hem of her skirt. Then she came to me one dawn in my cabin. She said she was moving in with me and said about convincing me how much I needed her. <laughs> I didn't have the strength to send her home. Angel laughed softly. <laughs> I can't imagine Miriam being that bold. She told me she learned courage from you. He hadn't known what she meant then. Now he did. Angel had loved Michael enough to leave him when she thought it was in his best interest. Miriam had come to him for the same reasons. If she hadn't, he would have gone back to the gold fields and drinking and spending time in the brothels, and he probably would have died up there with his face in the mud. <sighs> Miriam sent me to find you, Amanda. I want to take you home. He meant it. Amanda. Her throat closed and she smiled. Another burden lifted and she was grateful, but it wasn't that easy or simple. She couldn't let it be. I can't go back, Paul. Not ever. Why not? How much did he have to know to understand and become her ally? There's a lot about me you still don't know. Then tell me. She chewed on her lip. How much was enough? I was sold into prostitution when I was eight, she said slowly, staring down at nothing. I never knew any other way of life until Michael married me. She looked at him again, and I never understood him. Not the way he hoped I would. I, I can't change who I was. I can't undo the things that happened. Paul leaned forward. You're the one who still doesn't understand, Amanda. There's something I didn't even comprehend until now, because I was too stubborn and jealous and proud. Michael chose you. With all your past, with all your frailties, with everything, he knew from the beginning where you came from, and it didn't make any difference to him. There were plenty of women back home who would have jumped at the chance to marry him, Sweet, sensible virgin girls from God-fearing families. He never fell in love with any of them. He took one look at you, and he knew right from the beginning. You, no one else. He told me all that, but I thought it was sex. Now, 
I know it wasn't. It was something else. A crazy accident. I think it's because he knew how much you needed him. She shook her head, not wanting to hear it, but Paul was determined. Amanda, he bought you out of bondage with his own sweat and blood, and you know it. Don't tell me now you can't go back to him. It hurt too much because she still loved and needed him. Sometimes she thought she would die without the sound of Michael's voice. She would close her eyes and see his face and how he walked and how he had smiled at her. He had taught her how to play and sing and rejoice, things she had never known. And the sweetness of those memories was agonizing, the separation unbearable. Sometimes she tried not to think about him at all because the pain was so great, but the hunger for him was always there, the endless aching hunger. Only he had opened himself to be used in her life by Christ. Through him, Christ had been able to fill her until she was overflowing. Michael had always said it was God, and now she knew that it was true. And her knowledge that he'd been the bridge between her and her savior only made her long for Michael all the more. She couldn't allow herself to think of all that. She had to think of what was good for him, not what she wanted for herself. She had purpose now and satisfaction in her life. She wasn't plagued by nightmares and self-doubt, at least not till now. And she had to tell Paul the complete truth so he would understand. I can't have his children, Paul. Never. Something was done to me when I was very young to make sure. She had to stop and look away briefly before she could go on. Michael wants to have children. You know that. It's his dream. She faced him again. Can you understand now why I can't go back? I know you would take me back again. I know I would still be his wife, but it wouldn't be fair, would it? Not for a man like him. She struggled to control the tears that were so often near the surface lately. She would not give in. She couldn't. If she did, she would cry until she melted away to nothing. Paul didn't know what to say. Please, she said. When you go back, don't tell Miriam you saw me. Say anything. Say I left the country. Say I died. He cringed inwardly, hearing his own thoughts come back to haunt him. Please, Paul, if you tell her, she'll only tell Michael, and he'd feel he has to come get me again. Don't let him find out where I am. You needn't fear that. He told Miriam he wouldn't drag you back this time. He said it was your decision, that you had to come back on your own, or you'd never really understand that you were free. He wanted more than anything now to convince her she had to come home again. Did you ever tell him you couldn't have children? Yes, she said quietly. What did he say? She shook her head, dismissing it. You know, Michael. Indeed, he did. He stood up and put his hands on the desk. He married you, Amanda, for better or worse. And for as long as you're both alive, and that's how long he'll wait for you and past that, if I know Michael. If you only knew how much he's hurting, don't. You know him. Did he ever give up on you before? He won't give up waiting for you now. He'll never give up. She shook her head, pale and distraught. I can't go back. Paul straightened. He didn't know whether he had given her something to think about or just caused her more pain. I've said all I can. It's up to you, Amanda. Just don't take too long making up your mind. I miss my wife. He wrote down the name and address of the hotel where he stayed the night before. I'd like to leave by nine tomorrow. Send word what you decide. He picked up his pack and shouldered it. What is this place, anyhow? A boarding house? She looked up at him, pulled back from her dilemma. In a way, it's a home for fallen women, women like me, who want to change their lives. We've been very fortunate. Several wealthy citizens gave us financial help. The man at the bank, Paul thought. God, forgive me. What a fool I've been. You started it, didn't you? 
not all by myself. I've had a lot of help along the way. What do you, what do you teach them in there? He nodded toward the big room through the door and down the hall. Reading, uh, writing, enciphering, cooking, sewing, how to run a small business. As soon as they're ready, we find positions for them. We've developed a way to accomplish that with the help of several churches. Father Patrick had seen, had been to see her often. Some Catholic priests were a lot like Michael, devoted to God, humble, patient, and loving. She hesitated. Magdalena is one of the things I needed to think about. I need to think about, Paul. They need me here. No matter how good a cause, it's just an excuse now. Pass the torch to someone else. That tall lady with the laughing eyes looked like she could take care of things. He went to the door. Your first obligation is to Michael. He had said all he could. I'll wait until noon tomorrow at the latest. Then I'm going home. Angel sat for a long time, thinking, after he left. The sun went down, and she didn't light the lamp. She remembered sitting on the hill a mile from the farmhouse and Michael saying, This is the life I want to give you. And he had. How could he know what he had done for her? How could he even guess that her life was new because he had shown her the way to live? Paul thought she had back, gone back to prostitution. What if Michael believed the same thing? She couldn't bear for him to believe that. It would make everything he had ever done for her meaningless, and it had meant everything. God, was I wrong? Should I go back? How can I face him again after all this time? How can I see him and walk away again? What do you want me to do? I know what I want. Oh, God, I know. But what do you want me to do? She held herself and rocked, biting her lips and fighting the grief. How can I not say thank you to him? Did I ever really explain what he did for me? What have I ever given back to him but grief? But she had gifts to offer him now. She had stood firm against Duke. She had walked the road Michael had taught her. Because of it, people had trusted her and backed her in building the house of Magdalena. She was doing good with her life, and it was all because of him, because of what she had seen in him. Seek and ye shall find, he'd read to her, and she had. Maybe if she found a way to tell him, it would give him peace. Sarah, beloved, God, I won't ask for more than that. She closed her eyes tightly. I won't ask for you. I won't ask you for more. Classes were long over when she left the office. The girls had finished supper and retired to their rooms. Angel went up the stairs. She saw a light beneath Susanna's door and tapped. Come in. Angel entered. What's happened? Susanna asked, getting up from the bed and coming to her. She took her hands. You look so pale. We missed you at dinner. Who was that man? A friend. Susanna, I want you to run Magdalena for me. Me, she said, astounded. She looked less assured than Angel ever remembered. She let go of her hands and stepped back. You can't mean it. I couldn't. I mean it, and yes, you can. Susanna was more than capable of handling things. She just didn't know it yet. She could walk through fire and come out on the other side even stronger than now. Angel was suddenly very sure of that. But why? Where are you going? Home, Angel said. I'm going home. <laughs>